Hey everyone, today we're looking at fractal geometry, a whole field of iterative mathematics with the output as shown here on the screen. Now there's tons of these algorithms that will create all different types of nested geometry. Today I'm going to walk through the basic theory of fractal geometry, then we'll take a deeper dive into the algorithm that creates this Legend of Zelda Triforce logo, and then I'll show you how to write the code for MATLAB. Fractal geometry uses iterative math that creates nested geometry. You start by typically defining a function f of x. You provide an input through which you receive an output, and then you use that output as the next input to that same function. Written here in math terms, you start with a random value of a, f of a gives you b, and then you calculate f of b, which gives you c, you throw c back in, f of c equals d, and so on. Here we start off with the vertices, the pink triangles shown at 0, 10, and the top of the graph. The initial position is shown in black at the center. We start off by picking a random vertice. Here the top one is chosen. And we calculate the midpoint and place a value there. And that value will stay on our graph. Now from here, we select another vertice at random. We calculate the midpoint and place a dot. One more time, we select another vertice at random which happens to be the same bottom left vertice. We calculate the midpoint and we place a dot. We do this hundreds of times and fractal geometry will result. Let's move into MATLAB to see more. Let's take a crack at fractal geometry with MATLAB. We're going to start by defining our triangle. The base of our triangle, we'll call try B, that'll be 10. We're going to do 100 iterations. This will plot 100 dots eventually. And we need an initial position, which I'll have as the X is 5 and the Y is 3. I've simply stored this in a 1 by 2 matrix. We need to calculate, based off try B, our vertices, point 1, 2, and 3. Point one is just going to be zero, zero. I want that to be our bottom left point. Point three is easy. That's just the whole base of 10, and then the y is zero. Point two is a bit trickier. We know that since it's an equilateral triangle we're working with here, our base is just going to be one half for the x value. But for the y value, we have to use some trig and it's important to note, if you look at cosine, and in fact any of the trig functions, the argument has to be in radians. So here I do cosine of 30 degrees, but I need to convert this using pi over 180 as my conversion factor. And then I can get cosine of a radians value, which gives me the point to y value. Excellent. Now we need to think about how we want to write our script and the real algorithm to get this fractal geometry. I'm going to use a for loop. Once again, we've got a certain number of iterations that we want to run. And I'm thinking how I want to do this. It'll be 4i equals 1 to n, of course. And I'll want to end my loop. But we're going to have to pick a value at random. So we're going to pick a random vertex. Based on that vertex, we need to do different things. We're going to want to calculate midpoints based on vertex. So this might be a good switch statement area because we can switch based on whichever random vertex is selected. Then we're going to want to save the values and... Well, we'll see how that goes from there. First thing we should do is pick a random vertex. We've used rand before, but rand will give us a value between 0 and 1. 
continuously. If we use Randy three and we run this a few times. Yeah, it confirms my suspicions. This will give us a value between, well, it'll give us one, two, or three with equal randomness. So let's do call event. We'll make that our variable and that'll hold Randy three and that holds one, two, or three. And if we get a one, we'll go to point one halfway. If we get a two, we'll go to point two halfway and so forth. Let's call switch then on the event variable. And then the case will be event is one. We'll have a case event is two and we'll have a case three. We could also make this otherwise, but for clarity, since we're only working with three very discrete cases, I'm going to do this. At this point, I want something that's gonna calculate my midpoints. I'm gonna go ahead and create a function, midpoint function that'll do that for us. I'm going to do function, the output will be the midpoint. We'll have an X and a Y value included in that. And that'll equal, let's call our function, eh, calc midpoint, nothing fancy. And we're gonna have to do two values. Let's do the current position and the target position. Current being the current dot that we have that we're at and target being that other vertices that we're looking for. I'm just gonna end this to make sure everything's running okay. I'm running this and getting an error not support in this context. Let's scroll up. This is the right function definition. I know that. We ended this for loop. Ah, we didn't end this switch statement. Need to end that. And now if we run, everything's okay. That was our issue. Moving forward now, let's define this calc midpoint function. We wanna do a couple things. Firstly, let's go ahead and calculate the midpoint for X and for Y. So midpoint, let's call this one and we're gonna have a midpoint and two. So we'll have two values in midpoint. One's the X, one's the Y. This first one will take current pose one, add it to current uh, target pose. one and then we want to divide that by two and that should give us the midpoint x value right if we have two points let's say nine plus two when we divide answer by 11 or sorry by two that gives us 5.5 .5, which is halfway between nine and two we do this same approach. For the Y value, the second index for both of these, and that should do it for that function. And we can try this by calling calc midpoint, and we need to give it two values. Let's say one, one, and 10, five. Oh, we can't call this in the command window because this function is only defined inside the scope of this script. If we had a separate M file, we'd be able to call this. But this function is only created during the script that's running. You can see we don't have a function in the workspace to use. We'll need to try this in our script. So let's call calc midpoint on a couple things here. We'll need to call it. We can just do it for case one for right now. We wanna call our first argument is the current position. We don't have that defined yet in our script. So we'll need to find a current position. Well, init pose will be our first position that will make current. So let's add right here, current pose is init pose. And that way we initialize the current position variable. And then we can call current pose. 
And what's that target pose? That'll be whichever event happens. So based on that event, we'll do, if it's the first, we'll do point one. And we had defined point one previously, so that should work. Let's simply run this and we should get outputs because in the 100 trials that we're running, we should get about 33 outputs if it's an even distribution of this. So let's give it a try to make sure. There we go, we're seeing a bunch of midpoints that are coming out here. This is looking okay. Let's make sure we comment it out, anything that the midpoint generates. And we can run our script again. And there we're seeing we get the midpoints for everything. They're all the same because we're not changing the current pose anywhere in the loop. Let's make a note that we need to change current pose here. And we're going to need to save these values. So let's save, what do we want to save this as? Actually, we can probably save this as current pose because now we have that new value coming from here. So we can save our current pose from this. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Let's grab this. For each case, we're going to do similar, except we're going to do point two for case two and point three for case three. And we changed our current pose already. We're going to wanna to save these current pose values to do that, let's just start stacking them in a matrix. So we can do a all pose matrix, and we're going to wanna to keep adding these as we go along. So let's add the ith value, the x value, and we're going to add the ith value, the y value. This will be a two column matrix with all the values. That'll give us current pose. We'll store the first value there, the X and current pose, the second value, which is the Y. And then we go to the next loop, event happens. We switch on the event. We save that as current pose. Sweet, this should be good. If we run this, let's see, now we're getting all these current poses out. We need to comment in our switch statements so that these don't go out. Suppress the outputs. Good, we're getting no outputs now. We just need to plot. We can go ahead and say plot. We have that all pose matrix. Let's plot all the rows and we want those first column values. And then we'll do all pose, all the rows and the second column values. And let's take a look at this. Oh geez, yeah, it's a line right now. We wanna specify this as how about black dots. So we'll do dot K is black. We'll run this. Doesn't look like very much right now, but let's see about, we wanna add in our points for sure. We want these guys in there to show us kind of our bounds. So those are called 0.1, 0.2, 0.3. Let's do hold on, we're going to plot what we want here. Let's make a matrix of all the X values and a matrix of all the Y values. So for this, we can call point one, one, point two, one, and point three, one. This pulls the X value from each of them and we're storing it in a matrix like that. And then we'll do the same thing here, but we'll grab the Y values, which is the second term in each of these. And then we save that in a matrix. Let's plot these as, I think we had them as magenta diamonds. Dot, dot, dot. So we can go to the next line. Let's change the marker face color. Also to magenta, and let's change the marker size to be a bit bigger. Let's make these, I don't know, 
Seven. We'll see what that looks like. Let's run this. Okay, now we're starting to see something. I want those to be a much bigger, though. I'm going to make those 14. And let's add a lot more points. We're not quite seeing the fractalness yet. Let's increase this to 500. Run this. Whoa, you guys starting to see this? Let's add a bunch more. Let's do 50,000. It's going to take a bit to run because we have a lot of calculations we're doing. But holy cow, look at this. I'm going to move this around and zoom in. These triangles are the same triangles that we're seeing on the outside. This guy here looks the exact same as the whole thing in many ways. And the more we zoom in, the more of these patterns that we'll see over and over and over if we keep providing enough values. Now we have computational limits on how many values we can calculate without overburdening our system. But isn't this wild? Here we have a concept brought from fractal geometry, whole different field of mathematics, and we're able to apply our knowledge of MATLAB to solve this real-world problem. It's not the problem where you have a clear-cut one-answer solution, but we're able to create a script, which is a solution for implementing this algorithm from fractal geometry. Hope you enjoyed this video on fractal geometry and how we can apply MATLAB's principles to perform these calculations.